If you happen to live in a family environment where you share space with someone, where you live in close confines with someone, even someone you especially love, it might be a husband, it might be a wife, it might be a bunch of children. If you live in that sort of close confines with someone, you'll know that there are moments in time that bring out the worst in all of us, right? Sometimes the ones we love the most, we can take for granted the most. Sometimes the ones we love the most, who share the most intimate spaces with us, can, can irritate us the most, right? I mean, when you live in that close confine with someone, where you're literally sharing life and space together, there are times when, we, when the worst of us rubs up against the worst of the other person, and what comes out in those moments, angry words, frustration, loud words, God forbid, even worse sometimes in terms of physical violence and the like. One of the things that we have to learn to do, one of the, the arts we have to cultivate, one of the necessities we must practice when we're living in close confines with those we love the most, is the experience of giving and receiving forgiveness. The, the receiving of forgiveness implies, of course, that we have done wrong and we need to acknowledge what we have done. And that takes humility of soul to come to someone and to say, I've done what is wrong. Uh, here are the specifics of what I did that was wrong. I realize the way this has hurt you and I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? Then, of course, there's humility of heart on the side of the person that has been wronged to be willing to let go of that demand of self that says, I must get my revenge. I must get my own back on this person who has done me wrong. That is a form of pride that often leads to us not being willing to forgive somebody else. And in an environment, whether it's, a, whether it's a close family unit or whether it's a workplace, a degree or two removed, or whether it's even just strangers and acquaintances, where there is, that, where there is pride on both sides of that equation, the person who has done wrong in their unwillingness to acknowledge, to consider the ways in which they've done wrong, their unwillingness to think about the ways that it's affected someone else, or the pride in the other person's heart that they are not willing to let the other person off the hook, as it were, you know, to, to retract their desire for revenge, to get their own back. When, when, there is, when there is pride on both sides of that equation, there is often the dissolution of a relationship. That is the condition where relationships completely come apart and there is no healing because there's no willingness to be forgiven and there is no willingness to give forgiveness. It seems to me that one of the things that should differentiate those who are followers of Jesus Christ from those who are not are especially the ability to know our own hearts and to seek forgiveness when we need to and on top of that the willingness to give forgiveness even when it hasn't been sought by the person who has done us wrong. And the reason I say that I think this would be one of the quintessential hallmarks of a Christian experience of, a, of someone who's given themselves to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is because that is exactly what we see in our Lord and in our Master. One of my favorite verses, I quote it often because it really speaks to me, is Romans 5 verse 8. This idea that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Or we can think about 1 John 4 verse 11 that says... We, uh, in the same way that we have been loved by God, this is the basis and the reason why we ought to love others. And, and, and when you think about this, uh, we, 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 kind of, we were forced to conclude that if we are a disciple of Jesus Christ, we will love the way he loved, we will forgive the way he forgave. And Matthew 10 verse 28 speaks about, freely you have received, so freely you should give. This idea that what we receive from God, we pass on to others. It's no wonder when you read Matthew chapter 6, which has the Lord's Prayer in it, one of the ingredients there that Jesus speaks about is, forgive us our debts as we forgive others or those who trespass against us. It's this idea that as we become partakers in the forgiving grace of God, recipients of His mercy, recipients of His kindness, recipients of His grace, so too he asks us to do the same for those in our circle of influence who do us wrong. And it makes sense, right? If somebody's been generous to you, pay it forward by being generous to someone else. If someone's been gracious to you, pay it forward by being gracious to somebody else. If somebody has shown mercy to you, pay it forward by showing mercy to someone else. Share the love, we might say, right? 
It's this idea that is portrayed in one of the parables that Jesus told. The parable of a man who had a great debt against a king. He had squandered the king's wealth. Somehow he had gotten himself into uh, serious financial trouble. And in Matthew 18, Jesus tells the story of this man who's brought before the king. And as he's brought before the king, the king says to him, It's time to settle the account, mate. It's time for you to pay up what you owe. The man, of course, doesn't have the money. He doesn't have the wealth. He can't meet the debt. It's so far beyond his grasp that there is just no ways he could pay it back. The king knows this. But the man, of course, he seems by what he says to still think that maybe he could make up for what has happened and, and, uh, and pay the king back. It says in verse 25, it says in verse 25 of Matthew chapter 18, Since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment be made. The slave, therefore, falling down, prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. This man actually thinks that somehow he will still be able to pay the king back. But the king knows that this is beyond a lifetime of debt. This is beyond a lifetime of work. This is beyond a lifetime of luck. There is no way that this slave, the servant, will be able to pay him back. So the king has to decide. Am I now going to show mercy and cancel the debt? Or am I going to proceed with what I've threatened to do, which is throw this man in prison along with his family until they serve their, their time, which will be a lifetime for him and his family. There will be no getting out of this. They will be in prison for the rest of their life. And this was a common practice. This was the way they dealt with bad debts back there in the time of Jesus. We, of course, in our day and time, wouldn't dream of this. You'd declare bankruptcy, you'd go through a process, and eventually your debts would, would, be, would be canceled, right? But it wasn't such a friendly world back in that time, some 2,000 years ago. So Jesus capitalizes on this, on this customary practice, and he says, this is a little bit like your standing before God, my standing before God. The people he's talking to in, in the time that he's talking, he says, this is your standing before the Heavenly Father. You have incurred a debt that you cannot pay back. With all your best of religiosity, all the best of your good works, all the best of your generosity and your sacrificial giving, all the best of your positive thinking, all the best of the energies you hope to pass on to others, there is no way you can pay back this debt incurred by you individually and by the human race as a whole beginning at the time of the Garden of Eden. The wages of sin is death. And there is no way that your good works can outweigh your bad works. So think about this. It's this idea that, and we find, we find, this, we find this idea of being able to pay back our, our bad debt in multiple religions and philosophies around the world. I mean, for instance, think about the law of karma, right? This idea that what goes around comes around. And there's an element of truth to that because you do teach people how to treat you by the way you treat them. But this idea that you, you will receive back in your body in kind and in full measure what you give. So therefore, if you do lots of good things, you will be elevated. And if you do lots of bad things, then you will be uh, denigrated. You will, and of course, the, the idea of the afterlife comes into this and the way that you earn your lot in the next life by how you live in this life, right? This idea that some religious people have that, yes, I do do bad things, so I'll do a whole lot of good things. For every bad thing I do, I'll do two good things. As if when you are faced with God one day, He's going to put your good deeds on a scale and your bad deeds on a scale, and the whole goal is that your good deeds must outweigh the bad deeds. That is not how biblical Christianity works. That is not the teachings of Jesus. What's highlighted in this parable is that this man's debt was irrecoverable. There was no way that he could return to the king what he owed. So the king had a choice to make. Was he going, was he now going to follow through on putting this man in prison with his family? Or the alternative was the king himself would actually have to absorb that loss because no one could return what the servant had lost. So it says here, in verse uh, 28, uh, verse 27, that the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him 
and forgave him the debt. This is a picture of the heart of God. Matthew 18 verse 27 is a picture of the heart of God for you and for me. He looks at us. He realizes our helpless condition more than we even realize it. Remember, this man is still lying on the floor before the king, pleading his case. You know, just give me more time. I will pay you back. I will find a way. I will make it happen. Look, I'm good for it. Please don't lock up me and my children. Uh, somehow, by, by hook or by crook, I will make it up to you, king. He's still pleading his own abilities to the king. The king, who has the right diagnosis, looks at this man and realizes there is no way that he will ever make it up. And he has compassion upon him. And the compassion means that the king chooses to absorb the loss right off the debt so this man can go free. I want you to notice in this parable that although forgiveness is a free gift or a gift that is given freely, Forgiveness is never free of cost. Any time you are forgiven, somebody else has absorbed the cost of what you have done. When we are forgiven by God, it is because He has absorbed the cost of what we have done. That is the story of the cross. Jesus dies in our place, right? He has absorbed the wages of sin, which is death. It has cost heaven everything to give you freely the gift of acquittal or of forgiveness. So do not think that the free gift of forgiveness and reconciliation with God is in fact costless or cheap. The reality is it costs heaven everything to bestow the gift upon you freely. Freely given but purchased at infinite cost. Which is why when you come to understand this, you begin to realize the importance of gratefulness. You begin to realize how valuable that gift is and how you and I dare not treat it as something cheap. We dare not take it for granted. It has been purchased at the infinite cost of the blood of Jesus, the life of God himself laid down in our behalf that we might have life, forgiveness and reconciliation. Now listen carefully, the story doesn't end there. It doesn't end with a picture of God's heart. It contrasts the heart of God with the stony cold heart of man. So let's turn our attention to this contrast because it says here, it says here in verse 28, But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him saying, Pay back what you owe. Now you've got to realize here, you've got to realize here that the comparison between what the, what the man owed to the king and what his, his equal, his fellow slave owed to him is like, it just, it's exponentially different, right? What the man owed to the king could not be paid back in a lifetime of hard work and good luck, right? But the, what, the, what, the, what the servant owes his fellow servant is a hundred denarii. Now one denarius was about the equivalent of one day's worth of work. So this is a third of a year to pay back his mate, right? One hundred days of labor would pay his mate back. But there is this incredible intolerance on the part of the man who has been forgiven this inestimable lifetime's debt, right? He grabs him by the collar. He's choking him around the neck. You can see it's very graphic. You could even say it's very violent. He is insisting that this man pay back this debt. 100 days worth of labor. I want it. I want it now. No mercy. You are going into the prison that I should have gone into. Uh, but off you go. There is no mercy. There's no compassion. And this happens in the parable seemingly right after the man's received this incredible acquittal, this incredible forgiveness of his debt. Yeah, you see the contrast between the stony cold heart of mankind, the selfish heart of mankind versus the, the, the beautiful, compassionate, merciful heart of God in, in forgiving the man his debt. And you've got to wonder to yourself, 
Is this again not our story? Is this not the case that, that we are all too happy to receive grace and forgiveness from God, but all too slow to give grace and forgiveness to others? Is it not true that we keep our resentments, we hold on to our grudges, we, we, we keep score with the people around us, all while we expect and hope for the grace of God to be shown to us? Is it not true that we feel the pain that others inflict upon us acutely and we're slow to release that, but we do not really understand the pain that has been inflicted upon the heart and upon the body of Christ through our sin? Is it not true that just like in this parable, we are quick to hold others to account while we desire to be forgiven by others or forgiven by God. Unfortunately, I think this is exactly why Jesus told this story, because this is the human paradox, if you like. This is the way in which we contrast with the grace and the kindness of God shown towards us. So what happens? What happens next? Well, his fellow slave fell down and began to entreat him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Verse 31, So when his fellow slaves saw what, he, what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you entreated me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. So shall my heavenly Father also do to you, each of you who does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now Jesus here is emphasizing this point, that in essence, we manifest in the way we treat others, we manifest our heart standing before God. When we hold grudges, when we keep our resentments, when we keep score, when we let it build in our hearts, when we will not let someone off who has, who has come to us seeking our forgiveness, when we choose to hold that score against them, to keep reminding them of their faults and their failings, to, to keep them at arm's length, we will not reconcile with them, we will not forgive them, we will not open the door to the healing of a relationship. When we do that, we're actually saying something about our own heart more than we're saying about that person's acts towards us. We're saying actually that we have not truly internalized the grace that God shows to us. We're actually demonstrating that even if we claim the forgiveness of God, and even if we claim to be reconciled with God, our hearts have not been touched by that grace. We are like this man who has begged for forgiveness and is still trusting in our own abilities, still trusting that we can earn our place before God, and therefore we expect others to earn their place before us. In our if, if, if our hearts were touched, right, if we were so overwhelmed with gratitude, so aware of the, of the incredible gift that we had been given, the, the grace that we had been shown, that gratefulness, that awareness of our own heart and, and how blessed we are to be reconciled, to be given a second chance, that same, that same sense of gratefulness would drive us, would compel us to let go of what we believe other people owe us. Now notice this. When we forgive someone, when we forgive someone, it's not saying that what they did was okay. When we forgive someone, we're not saying that it's okay, you're free to do it again. No. Forgiveness is simply choosing to no longer hold that debt, that resentment, that aggravation against them. We no longer look at them as our enemy. We no longer treat them like they deserve. We show them the same grace, the same compassion, and the same kindness that we have received from God. Hey, when God forgives us, He's not saying what we did was okay. You know, often when my, when my children say to me, I'm sorry, Dad, I will say, it's okay. And it always occurs to me when I say it's okay. You know, it deserves a bit more of an explanation. We're not saying that what you did is okay. We are saying that we release you from the burden of debt that we believe you owe us. And so our relationship is now okay. Not what you did is okay, but our relationship is now open to restoration. Another thing I really want to highlight about forgiveness is that forgiveness is a one-way street. In this parable, you have the dynamic of forgiveness being played out with someone who actually asks for forgiveness. But it is clear in Scripture and it is 
clear in the way that God treats us that forgiveness isn't only something we give when someone asks for it, it's actually something we give well before they ask for it. In other words, we forgive them so that when they come to us and seek that forgiveness, it's already there to give to them. Does that make sense? It's a little bit like saving up for a rainy day. You save up for a rainy day so that when the rainy day comes, the resources are already there to bestow and to hand out. So too with forgiveness. We choose to forgive. We do that in the audience chamber with God. We bring our hurts and our pains before God. We pray for our enemies and for those who have done us wrong. Is that not found in the Beatitudes? At the end of the Beatitudes there in Matthew chapter 5 and 6, right? This idea that we pray for those who persecute us, pray for those who harm us, pray for our enemies. And in so doing, we, we cultivate the heart of God the character of God reproduced in us so that when that other person eventually comes to their senses, realizes the way in which they're damaging the relationship, realizes the way in which they're hurting us and hurting themselves, hurting the dynamic between us, and they come to us, it is not then that we begin to process. It is then that we manifest we have already processed before God. We have already received the forgiveness of God. We've already received the grace of God ourselves. And now we are ready to be channels of the grace of God towards others. The art and the power of forgiveness is that it is actually not something you do. It's not something you conjure within your own heart. It is not something you must produce in your own strength or that you must persuade yourself to accomplish in your own mind. The art, the trick, if you like, like of forgiveness is realizing that you are simply a channel through which God forgives that person through you. As they have wronged you, so too they have wronged God. And when they step towards you for reconciliation or for forgiveness, you show them the grace of God that has been showed to you. And you exercise the forgiveness of God towards them. So it is not a work of our own. It is the work of God in our hearts that goes out towards others. We become a channel of the forgiving grace of God, blessing the world around us. And that only happens as you and I realize the incredible debt that we owed towards God and the incredible forgiveness He has given to us. God doesn't ask you to do something that He hasn't first done for you. God doesn't expect you to go and pioneer a new thing. He simply asks you to walk in His footsteps, to be His disciple, to experience grace that you might give grace, to receive forgiveness that you might pass on forgiveness, which is why, which is why the king is heartbroken, which is why the king in this parable takes these extra measures of calling the servant back into his chambers to say, hey, wait a second, how can you hold this man's debt, 100 days worth of work, how can you hold that against him? Treat him so harshly when I forgave you a lifetime of debt. Jesus Christ has given us forgiveness and eternal life and mercy and compassion. How can we treat with harshness and with disdain and with accusation and with judgment and with punishment and with all those, all those things, with revenge? How can we treat others that way? And if we have claimed the name of Jesus, Christian, walking in the footsteps of Christ our Lord, then it seems to me that we should be fountains of grace towards others the way we have drunk freely from the fountain of grace, Jesus, as He has bestowed His kindness on us. God is simply asking us to do for others what He has first done for us. He's simply asking you to avail your heart to become a channel of grace through which He will work to bring reconciliation to others. Now, I just want to mention here, I've used the word reconciliation a number of times, but forgiveness and reconciliation are actually two different things. Forgiveness opens the way to reconciliation. But reconciliation only happens when the other person moves towards you to seek your forgiveness or when you move towards them to seek their forgiveness. Reconciliation means the healing of a broken relationship. Our wrongdoing and our actions cause breaks of trust. It causes alienation and separation. We, we lose intimacy between people because of the way we mistreat them or misspeak to them or betray them or their trust in some way. So now the relationship is broken because of our actions. 
The one who has been wronged is called upon to forgive even before the one who has done the wrong comes to them. Then when the one who has done the wrong comes to them and says, please will you forgive me, that person who has been wronged and who has been hurt has already begun to experience the healing from God and is able to extend the grace of forgiveness. Now the obstacle of hurt has been removed. Now the relationship can heal. That's the step of reconciliation. The fact that you choose to forgive someone even before they've asked for forgiveness, number one, does not make what they did okay. It simply opens the door to the possibility of reconciliation. So that if they then choose to humble their hearts, you can then forgive or let them know that they are already forgiven. And now that obstacle is removed from the way and the relationship is healed and restored. This is exactly how salvation works, by the way. At the cross of Jesus, Jesus is crucified. And I always like to think of it as crucified with his arms wide open, right? He, he's embracing the world. But every individual has to stand in their mind's eye at the foot of the cross and decide whether they will embrace him in return. That open-armed crucifixion act is the grace of God. And when you choose to, for, to accept that grace and embrace Him in return, that is the exercise of your faith, trusting that what He is doing is done in good faith with good intent to reconcile with you. You are in essence saying, I see you there, Lord. I see what you have done. I believe it and I accept it. And so he's, his embrace, which is the first step, is met by your embrace, which is the second step, and which is always only a response to his initiating grace. So he produces within you that warm, fuzzy, welcoming feeling, that sense of trust. What he has done opens the door for reconciliation. But you are not reconciled. You are not um, saved until you take the step to embrace him. Only when the relationship is restored by what he has done and your response to it, only then does salvation become an effective reality. God has forgiven the whole world at the cross, but the whole world will not be saved. Only those who choose to embrace him who has attempted to first embrace them. So too in your daily relationships, so too between husbands and wives, between parents and children, between work colleagues or mere acquaintances. Reconciliation, the healing of relationship, only happens when both parties exercise the humility of heart to let go of wrongs and on the other hand to acknowledge those wrongs. To be specific, not just, oh I'm sorry if I hurt you, that's not a seeking of forgiveness. You're not even sure whether you hurt them if you're saying, if I hurt you. I'm sorry that I hurt you. I'm sorry that I hurt you in these ways. And I know that when I hurt you in these ways, it affects you like this. This demonstrates on the behalf of the person who's seeking forgiveness. It demonstrates that they have thought about it. They've comprehended it. They, that they get it. And then it is the choice of the person who has been wronged in these ways to either be the channel of the grace of God or to be like the accuser of the brethren, like Satan, who says, nah, I'm going to hold it against you. I'm going to forever remind you. I'm going to forever hold it over your head. I'm going to hold this grudge and this resentment. I'm going to make you pay. But when you choose that, when you choose that path, like this man in this parable, you demonstrate that you never really understood, you never really comprehended, you never fully grasped, you never, you never truly received the mercy of God. Because if you had, you would realize you don't need to keep score because no one's keeping score against you. This man went out and strangled his fellow servant because in the back of his mind, he thought, yes, the king's forgiven me today. That's what he said now. But one day he's going to come back and he's going to want that debt repaid. So I'm going to get my own from every other person that owes me money. I'm going to get that. I'm going to store it because one day the king's going to come for me. He didn't really believe the king when the king said, you are forgiven. Yes, he took advantage that he had been let off. He got out of that, that, that courtroom as fast as he could. He was glad to be free. But did he really understand the heart of the king, the compassion of the king? 
that the king wasn't coming back to get his pound of flesh in a few weeks' time? Did he really get that he was truly forgiven? I would suggest to you that his actions towards his equal and his fellow servant demonstrates that the grace that had been shown him had not truly been comprehended. And I ask you the question, in your dealings with others who have wronged you, whether small wrongs or truly, seriously big, life-changing, life-altering wrongs, do you demonstrate that you have not yet fully grasped or understood the kind of grace that God has shown to you? We are all in this life, both victims and perpetrators of evil. We are hurt by others and we hurt others. And we have all hurt and betrayed the government of God, the character of Christ, the Heavenly Father. So I ask you, in the way you treat those who have wronged you, are you a channel of the grace of God to their lives? Do you manifest the fact that you have truly been forgiven and you get the debt that you have been forgiven, so you will not hold it against that other person? Do you realize that you get to be the mind, the heart, the very demonstration of the kindness and the compassion of God to those who have done you wrong when you choose to forgive them? And if you are the one who is on the side of doing wrong against others, do you realize the ways in which you need the grace of God so that when you receive the grace of God, that humility of spirit, you will be in a good position to go to others and humble your heart by seeking their grace and their forgiveness. You know, when we do this, I believe that there is no relationship that cannot be healed, no marriage that cannot be restored, no parental uh, parent-child relationship that cannot be uh, put back in right order. There's nothing that can come in the way of reconciliation when there is this two-way street of humility. Both parties realizing they're standing before God, realizing their need of the grace of God, and exercising their gratefulness for that grace as they move towards one another. You have not been asked to do anything that God hasn't first done for you. And the experience of what He has first done for you is the inspiration and the empowering that you need in order to show that kindness and that grace towards that other person. So I want to challenge you today with something that's very difficult. I want to challenge you to go against the inclinations of carnal nature, to go against the inclinations of selfish pride, to go against that tendency to want to retain our debts against others and to release them that they may be free and that you may be, may be free, and that the grace of God would be manifested in your life. Freely you have received, freely give. Let me pray with you. Father God Almighty, today we come with something that we desperately need your help in, because we are great at holding on to hurts, great at holding on to that which we believe is owed to us. And we need, we need your grace, Lord, to understand that you have released us and that it is okay to release others. Please, Jesus, put this quintessential evidence of the grace of God in our hearts, this ability to forgive, this willingness to reconcile, this, 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 this thing where we move towards those who have done us wrong as you have moved towards us. O oh, Jesus, have mercy upon us. Forgive our shallowness of heart and teach us to forgive even as and to the extent that you have forgiven us. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.